On this edition of Native Report, we hike through a Wisconsin forest to view the Thunderbird panel. We visit the Kingsley Mound Group, south of Wisconsin Dells. And we interview Lac Vita Zaire Chairman James Williams. We also learn something new about healthy living and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Native people have made their presence known across Indian country in the forms of petroglyphs and pictographs, otherwise known as rock art. Deep in what is known as the driftless area of Wisconsin is an outcrop of rock, and upon the rock face are several etched thunderbirds. Join us now as we learn about the Thunderbird panel. The forest canopy provides just enough shade from the midday sun as we hike through the forest in Juneau County, Wisconsin. Our guide today is former Ho-Chunk Nation President Cloris Lowe, an amateur archaeologist who is leading us to a most remarkable place. We're at a site today that is very special to me personally and to my family and obviously to many other people within the nation. This particular site is located on the edge of the Driftless area in Wisconsin. The Driftless area covers actually four states, primarily Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, and uh, northwestern Illinois. This site here is really doesn't have a name, but I call this the Thunderbird Panel. While it doesn't exclusively have Thunderbirds on it, most of the images here that were made by the people that came before us, our ancestors, are images of Sky Clan birds. And it's amazing that they have survived as long as they have, given the fact that this is on the edge of the Driftless. It is known by some people, non-native people, but for the most part today, it remains anonymous on the, on the landscape, which has, I think, helped a lot of it most recently over the last 40 or 50 years. I first came to this area almost 60 years ago, 58 years ago, was the first time I saw this panel when I was a, a, young, a young boy. I was brought out here by my father. And he said, you need to see this because this is important and it'll become more important as you learn more through the course of your life. What we have on here are many different Thunderbirds. This is a place that in this entire system of cliffs and valleys, this is the only area that really shows birds that have been carved into the rock and the rock faces here. Petroglyphs or rock art can be found all throughout Indian country. Whoever etched the Thunderbirds and other markings into the soft sandstone of the bluff is a complete mystery. An even bigger mystery is what do they mean? Petroglyphs, rock art like this, is very hard, if not almost impossible to date, with a few rare exceptions. These are at least a thousand years old, and they may be thousands of years old. As I take a look at rock art like this, I take a look at what potentially were the stories that were being left by the people that created this. This wasn't all created at one time. It's always wonderful to be able to sit back and look at sites like this and, and try to internalize what may have come here before us. But to understand that we're taking a look at the work of our ancestors, 
of the people here that preceded us and that it's still visible today and that it's a story that they're I believe trying to transmit what that story is specifically I don't know but I do know when I take a look at all of the Thunderbirds that are on here all of the Sky Clan images that are here these are the people that were here well as a member of the Sky Clan when I take a look at this in our oral history and we talk about our creation and the creation stories that we have they're not just stories and they're not myths it's something that that we believe in back at one point in time the Thunderbirds hunted men they hunted Ho-Chunks they were to be feared but there was a point in time where one man was protected by a Thunderbird and his name was Redhorn in our in our history in our oral history but it's a story of Redhorn and how the Thunderbird came down to protect him from the other Thunderbirds and from the other dangers in his life and it's at that point in my understanding that we as Ho-Chunk people came not to fear the Thunderbirds but rather to respect them because they were our protectors when I see these I understand when there's huge storms and there's lightning my grandmother always said to me don't be afraid of that this is when you are at your strongest it's the lightning from the Thunderbird that's coming down that gives us energy in the earth that gives us power there are other markings and graffiti on the wall face plus leftover plaster from state archaeologists who have surveyed the site throughout the years but this only further illustrates the importance of preserving sites such as the Thunderbird panel there's a couple of other images here in this rock art that you will see that look like geometric patterns these are the same images that I see that are 1500 miles away in deep canyons of the southwest there's a rectangle up there why is that there and why is it in Arizona and New Mexico and Utah and Colorado identical it forces me at least to understand that there was a lot of shared knowledge throughout what we now call the United States one of the things you'll see when you look at this rock art panel here aside from the petroglyphs that are here you'll see a tremendous amount of graffiti it's something that when I take a look at it I just I get a hollow pit in my stomach it makes me feel bad what protects a great many of these sites is that their locations are not shared to the general public I think sacred is a word that's perhaps overused a lot today but I would consider this to be in many ways a sacred site because of our people that are here all native peoples our ancestors people that preceded us here to this world as we see it today they were here and they left this for us and I think it's good for us to think about that and then to internalize that and maybe that's the message that they're leaving is this is important this is a part of who you are this is a part of who we are as a people we were here at one time and we know people will follow us into the future and we're leaving this for you to contemplate to work with and to understand what's important in life. I'm Dr. Arnie Vineo, and today we'll be talking about asthma, a breathing problem that can become life-threatening in a hurry. Asthma is a chronic respiratory disorder comprised of variable airway inflammation, obstruction, and hyper-responsiveness. Asthma in children differs from adult asthma and has child-specific guidelines. Adult guidelines should not be assumed to be valid for younger age groups. The prevalence of asthma has leveled off in many developed countries, 
but it still remains a common problem managed in clinics and emergency rooms across the United States. Most asthma sufferers have mild on and off bouts of illness and don't require daily medicines. Minimum doses of any medicine should always be used, and this is especially true for asthma. If, however, you need to take asthma medicines more than a few times each week, that indicates chronic inflammation and requires different medicines that are slower acting than rescue medicines because they work differently. The three major mechanisms involved in asthma are bronchoconstriction, or narrowing of the bronchial tubes, inflammation, and mucus production. Bronchoconstriction is when the breathing passages tighten up in response to an irritant and the rescue inhalers like albuterol relax that bronchospasm. Some of the bronchospasm medicines are short acting and some are longer acting. If someone needs to use these medicines often, they need to be on one of the prevention medicines. Prevention medicines work more on inflammation. When a tube gets puffy, it gets fat on the outside, but it gets skinny on the inside. The combination of bronchospasm and inflammation makes the breathing passages narrow and it turns someone into a whistle. Wheezing is a high-pitched musical sound best heard with a stethoscope. Most wheezing is heard when breathing out, and asthma is a disease that causes trapping of stale air in the lungs. For anyone with asthma, whether the problem is breathing in or breathing out doesn't really matter to them. Mostly it's the fact that they cannot get enough air. To make matters worse, while we all make mucus in our lungs to trap dust and irritants, with asthma that mucus can get stuck in narrowed airways. Steroids such as prednisone are reserved for the worst cases of asthma and they can be given as pills and sometimes need to be given as IV medicines in the hospital. Steroids can cause lots of side effects and can raise blood glucose readings in those who have diabetes. Any asthma plan needs to be based on good education and plans need to be tailored to patients individually. A peak flow meter is an inexpensive tool to have on hand to help decide when to add medicines or when to be seen by a healthcare provider. Non-traditional tobacco use is a very common trigger for asthma attacks in both adults and children, and quitting smoking is one of the very best treatments. Smoking during pregnancy and exposing babies to cigarette smoke may predispose them to asthma. Work with your health care provider to come up with an asthma plan that works for you. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vineo, and this is Health Matters. Next, historic Native burial and ceremonial mounds are special places. Just south of Wisconsin Dells is the Kingsley Mound Group. There are 20 conical, linear, and effigy mounds that visitors may view. And since 2006, the site has been owned and maintained by the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin. It is a late summer afternoon and the warmth of the day is slowly giving way to the coolness of the evening. This wayside rest on Highway 16 near the Wisconsin Dells is home to the Kingsley Bend Indian Mounds, a group of conical, linear, and effigy mounds built centuries ago. The mounds in this area here uh, were really constructed during the mound building period primarily, um, which was in a time period of 1,000 to 1,300 years ago. The mound group really consists of conical mounds uh, that are uh, circular mounds, uh, traditional burial mounds, and then there's effigy mounds here. There's quadrupeds uh, or bear mounds that are here. There's also uh, a water spirit mound, or some people call them a panther mound. And there are, there is a, across the road from here, uh, there is also a, a mound in here. Actually, it's two mounds in there, bird mounds. So that's your Sky, sky Clan. Some of the earliest mounds that are found in the upper Midwest area uh, are called red ochre mounds. And they're burial mounds where red ochre was actually utilized in the burial of people and those mounds date back to 500 BC. So those would be the earliest mounds here in this area of what is now the upper Midwest or here in the state of Wisconsin. When you take a look at these mounds, the impact of them visually are astounding, but I think what really is important to understand is what they mean and, and why they're here. The people that constructed these mounds in the past had a real understanding of their relationship to the earth. As we walked among the mounds, there was a sense that this was a solemn place. 
the silence was occasionally broken by the sound of a passing vehicle. The linear and conical mounds were obvious, less so were the effigy mounds. I went up on top of that hill there and uh, when I came here, I just looked, looked over all the places. Uh, before I started looking around, I, I said a little prayer because I figured some of the people that were here that probably was relatives of mine, you know, my ancestors. Then I start walking and st went around to look, see how many mounds there were here. And one of my grandfathers told me, when you see one of the mounds, he says, it's, it's just not, it's a mound there, but he says there's people concerned with that mound. That's how come it's built that way. These are sacred sites. I would argue these are, this is holy ground. Understand those are our people that are here. The Smithsonian came through the upper Midwest in the late 1800s and they did a survey. And in that survey, they were able to verify and map over 10,000 mounds. If you go back on those maps and surveys, the original ones, there are probably a thousand left from that original survey. There were originally 30 mounds in the Kingsley Mound group, but only 20 remain today. Since 2006, the site has been owned and maintained by the Ho-Chunk Nation. Some of the mounds near the mounds, if they weren't so high, that they got plowed under by farmers and stuff. And that's, I think that's going on had been going on for quite a while before anybody ever paid attention to any mounds and stuff like that. So that's the only thing that kind of bothered me. Imagine people coming to this area, non-natives, having no understanding or certainly no respect for the mounds, and they plowed on it and they planted on it. And worse than that, even as late as the 1880s through about 1915, people would take Sunday after church, take their picnics, their picnic baskets, their, their food. They would go to a mound group and proceed to dig into it to see what they could find. And that was their entertainment for Sunday afternoon. So we as people today need to understand we have a responsibility to caretake for this. And the Ho-Chunk Nation has taken upon themselves that responsibility specifically for this site here at Kingsley Bend. I'm the chairman of our boy task force. 30 years there, fish wars that went on back in the 80s and 90s. It wasn't easy to be called timber niggers, red niggers, wagon burners, or we gave you Indians all of this, everything. You guys don't know nothing. We still got that today. We still struggle with agreements with the state of Wisconsin and our fishing rights. We still identify who take care of the resource better than us. Nobody listens to us when it says that, you know, we try to explain what our grandfathers had said so we can explain it to our young people about the resource. We only take what we need because the grandfather gave us all these tools to use. The role of tribal government has changed over the years, and having strong leadership is important for a community's success in the 21st century. We sat down with Lockview Desire Chairman James Williams to learn about the past, present, and future of this Ojibwe nation located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. A warm and breezy August afternoon has a bed of wild rice in constant motion on Lac View Deserve. 
At one time in the past, this lake was home to Lac Vieux Desert Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Six miles north of here in Watersmeet Township is where the reservation administrative offices are located. You know, we have approximately 1,600 acres of land. It's a checkerboard uh, reservation. Uh, we don't have a lot of land base, but we continue to purchase land to uh, allow our people to stay within our community or people that want to come back to our community. We have uh, a little over 700 uh, tribal members now. I have been tribal chairman for at least 15 years now. Um, uh, the other 15 uh, were on the council, uh, vice chair, chairperson. So we have a nine member board, including myself. We have four executives. We have the chairman, uh, vice chairman, uh, the secretary, and our treasurer. <clears throat> and then the other five are council council reps. Um, we necessarily don't have any. We don't have districts. We're we're a small tribe, uh, so we 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 operate together. Um, the, this council that I'm working with now is very eager. They have the same visions that I have to um, you know provide that uh, growth for our community when it comes to economic development and um, you know just all around good services that when it comes to education and healthcare is very very dear to their heart when it comes to wanting to provide that for our community and especially for our young people. We're the big daddy here in, in, our, in, our, in our county and uh, the outside community looks for the tribes to really bring those, those jobs and other opportunities within the area. So it's, it's an honor that we can do that and I'm, I'm thankful that we can do that. And, and, it's, uh, and that, that gives us good relationship with our, with our surrounding communities as well. The nation has seen tremendous growth over the years and with the many changes come new challenges. Chairman Williams cites those who have been an inspiration to him. I was ins inspired by my, my grandmother. Um, she, was, uh, she took care of me as a kid. Um, you know, she uh, uh, cooked for me and made sure that I got to school. She's the strongest woman I've, I've ever known. I look back at um, a lot of our struggles with our elders, and I, I would have to say that um, the majority of our elders that went through the hard times, uh, you know, when I was a kid, to, to get get us to where we're at today. But I uh, I know every everyone's uh, um, uh, issues because I've been through them. As far as the uh, drugs and alcohol, the child abuse, you know, just um, and I guess that's what really, you know, when we talk about inspiration, those things d inspire me too because I want that stuff to go away. You know, I mean, I don't think we, you know, I can't do it myself, but it's a team effort. Most recently, the Lackview Desert Nation constructed a new health center. Plus, there are major development plans for the future. We're just uh, constantly looking to uh, uh, bring other economic development within our, within our home so our people can, you know, have a chance and an opportunity to work within the community and stay within our community instead of uh, having to go outside. It's a continued progress. Um, we continue to keep um, striving forward. Um, you know, exercising our sovereignty to, to do these types of things. Um, um, you know, the, the internet is the way to go now. We've, we've gotten involved in that. Um, so we keep progressing, uh, you know, as much as we can. We're really uh, staying focused on, um, you know, um, momentum moving, moving forward. What would you, uh, what words of advice would you have for the younger generation? Well, I just be proud of who they are. Never forget where they come from. You know, um, always have that belief. If you work hard, uh, you go you go to school, um, you get educated. Um, that you can do anything that you you your heart wants to do, and um, you know, just have a lot of good self esteem about themselves. Um, don't expect anything for nothing. You know, um, and I think. Uh, if you can conquer all those things, um, you know, I think you f you'll fulfill your, uh, you know, your, your calling in, in life. Um, and uh, just be respectful to people. And uh, I think that's the most, most important thing is to re respect yourself and uh, respect with the people that are surrounding you. We're compassionate people. We, uh, we care not only for our tribal members, but we, we care about the people that are outside of our community as well. Um, in the township, uh, for example, 
you know, we, we want to have a good relationship with them. We, uh, we, want, we want them to get rid of that mentality of the old school days about Native Americans because, uh, you know, we're all one people. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. <laughs>